Thank you very much, Cornelius. Thank you for putting me in, uh, in line with uh, Ad van Wyk and uh, Peter Terium with such sophisticated speakers. Uh, I try my best, although I slept like two hours last night in the airplane. Um, I'm with the Fraunhofer uh, Society and uh, I'm, yeah, it's interesting to get the, the $1 million question from Cornelius, how to accelerate. I think if we would know, we would just do it. Uh, the only answer is, um, that's what Peter said this minute, uh, just do it. I mean, that's the best way to accelerate. Um, I try to give some bits and pieces uh, to shed some light into the overall picture. Um, I'm the Fraunhofer Society for Applied Research is the largest organization for applied research in Europe. And uh, we're a, a staff of close to 30,000 people. And uh, one uh, part of the answer is to prioritize what you're doing. So we went through a portfolio process uh, last year and uh, we singled out, out of the 30,000 uh, scientists and engineers, what should they do? What's the most important uh, uh, stuff to do? What is the big thing? So these, we have seven big things, so to speak, uh, which is quantum computing, um, artificial intelligence and others, but one out of the seven is hydrogen. So just uh, put your coins into the basket on hydrogen. So this is uh, to, as to our, thinking as uh, at Fraunhofer, one of the next big things. Um, also, we, we do see, we do have a paradigm shift, uh, which happens now, which happens now in Glasgow, uh, which is of course uh, the, a global commitment to uh, the defossilization of the global energy system. This is also fairly recent, I would say. So this global uh, kind of commitment and uh, what started, uh, it's just uh, started last year with the Green Deal from the European Commission, the uh, net zero emission race. Um, uh, before that, even like early last year, so we had the, uh, the targets like reduce it by 80 to 95 percent this year too, but now we're in net zero. And this was not only the uh, European Commission saying that now uh, more than 100 states, half of the global community is now part of this uh, race, so to speak. Of course, we have different level of commitments in law. So this is, of course, the highest commitment. Uh, about 20 states uh, have it now in law um, as to when which target should be achieved. Uh, Germany is committed to 2045 uh, uh, to be climate neutral. Uh, actually, I have no idea how this should happen uh, in good uh, 20 years from now, but uh, let's see proposed legislation in policy documents and target under discussion. But that's all great news. Um, the, the small and the big players uh, uh, worldwide are somehow dealing with this topic, being carbon neutral somehow in the mid of this uh, century. Also very good news we have uh, heard several times today. Yes, we have this excellent uh, growth of uh, renewables. And uh, uh, as we speak, we are beyond three terawatt uh, installed capacity. If you add wind and solar and uh, water and the biomass on top of each other. And what's also great is that 80% uh, of all new electricity capacity uh, is in renewables. So the investment uh, clearly goes into renewables. And out of that, again, more than 90% of the new renewables are in solar and wind. So that's excellent. Uh, because we all know that the backbone of the future energy system globally will be green electrons. For whatever we do, we uh, will have green electrons. And uh, yeah, one cent for PV and two cent for onshore wind, of course, even a couple of years ago, I would not have thought that we will uh, be at this uh, level of uh, um, levelized cost of electricity. But now um, the, the kind of um, both, um, opportunity and challenge comes. Uh, green electrons cannot do the whole job. I hope someone could hear me before somehow. Uh, anyway, so uh, in Germany, for example, green electrons are only less than uh, like 20% of the energy of the uh, consumption of the primary energy. The rest is molecular based. So even if we're on 100% green electrons in Germany, which is doable, uh, somehow we only cover uh, one fifth of the challenge. The rest is fossil energy carriers uh, still in the system. The transport system, of course, is oil-based. 
process heat uh, is uh, pretty much coal based and natural gas is what is used for heating uh, our buildings. So this is the true challenge to defossilize all the other sectors. Electrons as in the electricity sector, that's uh, somehow on its way. And we can only do it uh, by the transformation of electrons into molecules. That's the solution. That's why we think that uh, that all has to go through hydrogen. And with hydrogen, we can synthesize um, all kinds of longer chain molecules, hydrocarbons and whatever we need. So this is the, the story. We are not the only one who understood uh, that this is a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. I started uh, this graph like two years ago with a couple of front pages of the national strategy papers. Now we're at uh, like 35 national uh, strategy papers, roadmaps of all kinds, R&D programs. Uh, and what makes it so nice, um, so I, I stopped at a certain point writing down the major uh, drivers. The drivers are not all the same. Of course, we, it's all about climate, uh, but also, for example, uh, South Africa, it's very much on PGM beneficiation and processing. They want to make a higher value chain uh, in the value chain in the country for the PGM means uh, platinum, iridium and all this, uh, because they just ship the raw materials and have nothing uh, in the value chain. China, for example, is very deep into clean air uh, for the big cities and so on. So the, the base for all this, um, if you put all these documents on top of each other, it's, it's huge uh, what all are the drivers. So that makes it very robust as a movement. Um, where are we? Um, so this is, uh, this, uh, there are still more to come. So this is an, uh, announced uh, here on the bottom. And uh, the, the investment is in the three digit of billion dollars, uh, which is announced not uh, till 2030. So this is announced for the next couple of years, both uh, private and public money. Um, yes, we are not lack lacking of, of investment, uh, but which uh, investment is uh, of course the best to do. And what is lacking the most, I must say, is the guarantees of a region. And this is, of course, a huge uh, uh, matter of discussion uh, because there is no such thing as green hydrogen or you don't see at the end of the uh, uh, tailpipe uh, what is uh, what quality is it. Uh, it's not radioactive. It, it doesn't tell you its story. Uh, so therefore, we need traceable, tradable, transparent and trustworthy guarantees of a region um, in order to say um, what's the carbon footprint. Because the truth, uh, again, is that there is no zero uh, carbon, there's only low carbon hydrogen, uh, even with uh, wind, you have like one ton of CO2 emissions if you produce one ton of hydrogen, if you consider the whole value chain with the, uh, the CO2, which is uh, like in the, in the wind power plant and so on. So if you do the whole math, so you start with one to one, of course, the worst you can do is with the natural gas and it's one to 10, you emit 10 uh, tons of, of CO2 for one ton of hydrogen. So, but this is really one of the big things uh, because in what do you wanna invest? So uh, between one and 10 tons. So this is kind of the, 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 the math and uh, what is low carbon, which can be considered um, as green hydrogen. Um, so, and to make it a bit more complex, I also like your quote that as a professor, you can do a busy graphs, which no one can read. That's one of them. Uh, just, uh, so we have three sectors, the sustainable feedstock, this is green electrons in our feeling. <laughs> it's uh, uh, carbon molecules and nitrogen molecules. And with this, you can formulate somehow, you can synthesize uh, your new world. In a way, um, you can do, of course, you can use hydrogen as it is. If you can transport it uh, appropriately, you can do chemicals and fuels and all, of all kinds. You can do fertilizers. Uh, so this is kind of the, parad the true paradigm shift that you can have your new world, uh, including polymers and whatever, without any fossil contribution. Um, so, but at, at a certain point, also, of course, the, the economy plays into the whole scene. Um, we were asked at Fraunhofer by Katharina Reiche, so from the National um, Hydrogen Council. Um, there are so many studies out. Um, what is the quintessence uh, of all studies? So they asked us uh, to read all the studies, put them on top of each other, 
and, and uh, define the corridors of the needs and uh, the ranges um, of all studies, both uh, European and uh, um, national uh, studies. And I'm happy to uh, present now 150 slides to you, which are the results. Um, so to put you to sleep, <laughs> now I just brought one, uh, which is this one, just to give you an, an order of magnitude. What you see here on the left-hand side, these are the, uh, the, the European studies, uh, which define a range up to 95% of CO2 reduction. What's the, the hydrogen uh, content of it? This would be between 95 and 100. And on the right-hand side, this is carbon neutrality. And as you can see, the carbon neutrality puts a lot of uh, pressure and a lot of um, hope, so to speak, onto the hydrogen uh, sector. In yellow, you see the hydrogen and uh, the bluish and whatever on top is the, the hydrogen derivatives, uh, all kinds of longer chain molecules uh, in the energy sector. So this is only between 95 and 100%. And the order of magnitude is uh, 1,500 terawatt hours of energy equivalent, uh, which we would need in, uh, in the next uh, like two, three decades. So the demand for hydrogen is rising very much with the level of ambitions you have in the defossilization of your system. Um, so the next would be, um, if you look at the global energy trade, there are exporters and importers. Um, just single out Germany, we're the fifth largest importer of um, energy. So uh, you can bring us whatever is uh, greener than we have at the moment. Huge quantities or whatever is bluish, these are the uh, importers. And of course, uh, what singles out here is uh, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Australia as the, the biggest exporter of energy. So if you um, look at that, we do have, of course, a trading system of uh, all kinds of energy carriers, which is well established over the last uh, like 50, uh, 150 years. And now we have to do the math somehow. So if we want to replace that with green molecules, where do we end? Uh, so we do the, uh, the homework of, uh, of Peter, so to speak. We do uh, all kinds of um, techno-economic uh, assessments. Um, so we, we start with the terrain slope of uh, any given area in the world. Uh, we, do, we extract whatever is not usable, like nature reserves. Um, military zones, land use, population density, well, that's, that's all included. So we, we start with, a, with an area and then we try to do the math um, at which cost uh, we can uh, produce uh, or any kinds of energy carriers. So this, in the case of Saudi Arabia, this uh, the land uh, which can be used um, in this respect. So, so this is the, the wind uh, map. Uh, this would be the photovoltaic web. Uh, um, map with more than 2,300 kilowatt hours per square meters. And of course, uh, NEOM, that's, that's not a, a accident uh, that NEOM was uh, singled out as a region. And uh, so this is uh, part of the results. We looked especially into liquid hydrogen, ammonia, and methanol in the years 2020, 2030, and 2050. And what you see here is uh, the, uh, the bits and pieces, energy electrolysis, the processing, uh, the transport transport would be to Germany because we are desperately looking for green molecules and uh, uh, the liquefaction, the shipping of liquid hydrogen, of course, is, is very important uh, um, as a cost driver, the direct air capture, which we use because if you don't want to use carbon from other fossil carbon sources, you have to do at the, the end of the day, direct air capture. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, the shipping is uh, the least expensive uh, with methanol. And uh, so finally, so these are roughly the, the cost. These are not the prices at the market, but the cost. And as you can see, so they do, they are not extremely different from each other. So it very much depends on the uptake of market, which market is willing to pay the premium at the beginning. So especially the, the truck sector, for example. So they definitely need liquid hydrogen, even if it's more expensive than other sources. So with this, um, my, my last slide, um, what is also part of the uh, um, answer, uh, how to accelerate. Of course, we need a mixture of, uh, of public measures and uh, private investments. And all these, uh, uh, 
uh, abbreviations uh, are uh, like from the public sector, that's from the Green Deal from the European Commission, uh, Fit for 55, um, which was just released a couple of weeks ago with new arrangements, but also with existing uh, arrangements, which went under uh, through a revision. Uh, like the energy emission trading system, of course, uh, then the energy taxation directive, all these kind of uh, directives and uh, the energy, uh, the sharing energy efforts, for example. I mean, they're, they're all very important. Finally, what is really important now is to close the economic gap between the, the green new molecules and the existing molecules in a well-established system, which is existing. We need probably one decade to bridge the gap somehow with carbon contracts for difference and other measures to uh, someone has to pay the, the, the in-between uh, to the true economy. Uh, but this is happening and, and the European Commission is very ambitious in uh, closing the gap that in like 10 years from now, this will be a self-sustaining market. And with this, uh, I would like to conclude. Uh, yes, we are now at a paradigm shift so the global trade of renewable energy based on hydrogen is beginning now. That's why we're here. That's why we're excited and in a good mood. And um, we, we somehow have to get the mole molecules migrating from A to B. Only money can make them migrate. Uh, that's what we discussed today. And uh, the last topic is maybe the most important one. The task is so big, and so not a single country, not a single region, not one sector can do the job. So we have to really work together as a global community um, in energy partnerships, and, but also research corporations. And uh, with this quote, because I liked it, I uh, would like to finish. The electric light did not come from the continuous improvement of candles. At a certain point, we have to do the paradigm shift that's uh, why we're here. So we're really entering a new phase uh, towards renewables and uh, to, towards the uh, defossilization of energy system. Thank you very much.